Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and honored guests, and welcome. My name is Cynthia Flynn Sulandros. I'm regent of the Sarah DeSoto Chapter National Society Daughters of the American Revolution. It is my distinct honor and great pleasure to welcome you this evening to tonight's Medal of Honor Tribute Dinner. We will begin this evening's program with the presentation of the colors by the Honor Guard Marine Corps Detachment 588, led by Sergeant of Arms Dave Klein, the Reverend Father Fausto Stampaglia of St. Martha's Catholic Church in Sarasota will lead the invocation. The pledge will be led by the Marine Corps Honor Guard, and we will recite the preamble to the Constitution and the American's Creed printed right in your program, in case you don't have it memorized. <laughs> Danny Bailu, field representative for Congressman Vernon Buchanan, will play the Star Spangled Banner on the trumpet. Would the audience please rise and remain standing through the national anthem. Mark I her her ho present her. Please remain standing while I do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing. Thank you. The beauty of being here and not in church, you don't have to fake that you look holy, okay? So, Let's bow our heads in prayer. Almighty God, creator of the universe and father of all of us, we bow to you with enormous gratitude for the freedom that we enjoy, the abundance that you have given us. And we ask you, Lord, always to keep our great republic free and brave from sea to sea. And now, Lord, bless the delicious food that we are going to enjoy. Bless the hands who has prepared that food. And through our generosity, let us fill the empty hands that have no food. Oh, and Lord, another little favor. Please make sure that there is a designated driver in every car. Amen. Amen. We the people of the United States of America, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. I believe in the United States of America as a government of the people, by the people, for the people, whose just powers are derived from the consent of the governed, a democracy in a republic, a sovereign nation of many sovereign states, a perfect union, one and inseparable, established principles of freedom, equality, justice, and humility for which patriots sacrifice their lives and fortunes. I therefore believe it is my duty to my country to love it, to support its constitution, to obey its laws, to respect its flag, and to defend it against all enemies.
Right turn. Will the audience please be seated? Our sincere thanks to the Marine Corps Honor Guard, Father Fausto and Danny Ballou. I am often asked, what is the DAR? Who are you and how do you get in and what exactly do you do? And I am always happy to answer this question and will do so briefly here tonight. Membership in the DAR is available to any woman without regard for race or ethnicity who can prove lineal descent from a patriot of the American Revolution. We are dedicated to our mission of promoting historic preservation, education, and patriotism. One of the very nice functions of the DAR is to recognize special people in our community who have shown exemplary service to these causes and tonight is certainly one such occasion. We are thrilled and honored to recognize Colonel John Saputo this evening. I would like to introduce our state officers and DAR dignitaries present here this evening. As I introduce you, will you please stand and remain standing until all are introduced, and audience, would you, would you please hold your applause until all have been introduced. Ginger Poffenberger, Florida State Society Vice Regent, and also serves the National Society on the Tomasi DAR School Advisory Committee, and serves as the State Vice Chairman DAR Schools, Tomasi, and the State Chairman of the Flori Florida Missouri Reception in Washington, D.C. Don Limangello, Florida State Society second vice regent, also serves the State Society vice chairman as vice chairman of chapter development and revitalization commission and DAR schools, Kate Duncan Smith. Barbara Weissman serves the State Society as treasurer. Bobby Schofield serves our national society as the Southeast Division vice chairman Americanism committee. Leanne Brown, as you, I'm sure, did not miss, <laughs> is the State Society Children of the American Revolution Chairman. Kimberly Car Carlton Bonner is the State Society Public Relations and Media Committee Chair Vice Chairman. Sharon Spry is Regent of the Manatee Chapter. Barbara Bartz is First Vice Regent of the Manatee Chapter. Jane Jackson is the second vice regent of the Manatee chapter. And Mary McFate serves the Sarah DeSoto chapter as American, Americanism committee chairman. You may now applaud. <laughs> Our master of ceremonies this evening, Ray Collins, is no stranger to many of you. He's been on TV for over 20 years in the Gulf Coast of Florida, including Fox 13 News in Tampa and ABC 7 in Sarasota. The Florida Associated Press named Ray Reporter of the Year. He's received an Emmy nomination, and he's in two halls of fame. He'll explain that to us later. He is currently a media consultant, and he's hosted hundreds of charitable events over the years and is happy to support his friend John Saputo. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome tonight's Master of Ceremonies, Ray Collins. I always arrive at the mic before the applause stops. I almost ran. <laughs> Full of a muscle on the way up. It's an honor to be here to honor our friend John Saputo. Let me tell you more about John that you might not be aware of. John is the, of course, 2014 recipient of the Medal of Honor Award for his professional standards, unwavering ethical and moral values, and dedication to humanitarian ideals. Upon graduation from Boston College, he was commissioned as an officer, second lieutenant, in the U.S. Marine Corps. He served active duty from 1972 to 1975 as an armor platoon commander and then a company commander of 275 Marines 
and then remained the Marine Reserve officer for 29 more years. John rose to the rank of Colonel in the Marine Corps Reserve. He served with distinction during Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and was one of just 300 members of the Marine Corps to be awarded a Bronze Star with Combat for Valor in 1992. In 2004, John was given the Defense Meritorious Service Medal while serving for General Tommy Franks and the U.S. Central Command for his service and deployment during Operation Iraqi Freedom to Qatar and Iraq. He retired from the U.S. Central Command in 2005 with a sterling report from General Tommy Franks. Throughout his military career and his position as the president and owner of Gold Coast Eagle, Saputo has always shown an unparalleled level of leadership and vision with a steadfast dedication to philanthropy, patriotism, and community service. Father, you join us? Now, when you see a priest bringing up a lot of pages, you know it's a permission to sleep. Now, I got only one. So, good evening, dear friends of my parishioner hero, Colonel John Saputo, and welcome all of you in this night of joy and celebration. In September 1943, the Nazi army occupied Rome, and the German paratroopers landed in San Paolo in Rome. After the bombing of Frascati, which was in that very same day, we were repatriated from the summer camps into the city, but not the, at home because we were too close to Grand Central. And because Rome was declared open city. One of the greatest joys in my whole life was on June 5th, 1944. I was a third grader. I know, I look young, but <laughs> I'll tell you a secret, but don't tell anybody. Don't tell the Protestant friends. If you are virgin, you live longer, you look younger, but a tad bit more miserable. But anyway, <laughs> so we were there and I was serving mass, third grade. And in those times, there were the nuns, they have eyes behind the veil. You don't turn ever, whatever happens. But the noise was so enormous. We couldn't do what the mother, we were looking at each other. We went to receive Holy Communion, and we saw the priest turning. 400 kids, 50 nuns have disappeared. Covered by the noise, everybody had left and went to the street. So the sacristan came, the nun, and she said, the Americani, the Americani sono qui. The Americans are here. Oh boy, the priest not even gave us communion, not even get the vestments out. We went, as in Joe, what a glorious sight. The American soldiers, there, under tanks, under trucks, not like the German, the Nazis, you know, they were like this. They were all smiling, and we were applauding and throwing to us. Probably some Catholics saw so the poor priest throw a pack of cigarettes, which I got, and throw me a chocolate that he got, so we switched. That was my very first vision of the American soldiers and Marines. Smiling, generous, friendly, and oh, so tall. <laughs> I watered the plants on my feet for years, didn't work, didn't grow up. So from that moment on, Italy has been free from wanton, from famine, from war from dictatorship. So thank you, first of all, if there is anyone soldiers of the greatest generation, and thank you to all of you who have served in the armed forces. I'm a child of your sacrifices, of your blood, of your freedom. 
And we would have told me that 50 years ago, 20 years later, I was going to be sent to the United States to serve in New York City, Harlem. But that's OK. <laughs> there was plenty of nice soul food. So <laughs> now you know why I am so proud to be here to say to Colonel John, and to him, in him, all of you American friends, thank you. Never, you know, the famous expression, I could never understand, don't let the turkey put you down. The turkey, the Turkish? What, did, what does it mean? Now, after so many years, the new administration, I know who the Turkish are, but anyway. <laughs> Thank you for your example of courage, leadership, friendliness, which for years has been the symbol of these United States of America. Thank you. Keep up the ideal. Never let the flame of freedom die. See, if I was in church, I would say, do not applause, take those cents, put them in the pocket, get the money out, you know. <laughs> but there is no collation today. So listen, I got another meeting with the Knights of Columbus. I love you all. Enjoy your food. And please, the designated driver. All right. Good night. God bless. That's a, a tough act to follow. You should talk to McCurdy's Comedy Club. He, he works on Sundays, though, I understand. <laughs> I want to call up now Judge Mary Ann Bame. As she comes up, I'll tell you that uh, she was Miss Florida, 1991. And the reason that's an issue right now is her platform was veteran services. And right now, Judge Mary Ann Bame of the 12th Judicial Circuit will be singing God Bless the USA for us. Cause there ain't no 
Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Thank you very much, Judge Baim. Very nice job. I want to read a few of the testimonials from uh, three of the nominators who were involved in the Medal of Honor nomination. The first off from Congressman Vernon Buchanan. As a member of my Veterans Advisory Group for Florida's 16th Congressional District, Colonel Saputo has provided me with his insights on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and other conflicts in the Middle East. He is a strong and effective advocate for soldiers returning from service in the War on Terror, working to ensure that they are provided with opportunities to succeed in civilian life. Also, welcome to Matt and Diana being here as well, the Congressman's son and daughter-in-law. Also, State Senator Bill Galvano said, John's leadership and dedication to our country earned him the Bronze Star. John's service continues. His policy of hiring honorably discharged veterans, whether he has an opening or not, has earned him the respect of his colleagues. Dick Vitale says, John demonstrates underlying devotion to this nation in every aspect of his life. His collaborative efforts help to improve our local economy. His leadership in local causes has undeniably allowed our local area to improve the conditions of our most vulnerable citizens. Colonel Saputo represents all of the traits of the founding fathers of our great nation. That is from Dick Vitale. Two others involved, Marine Colonel Taz Olson and also Marine Colonel Kent Ralston also wrote testimonials as well. Colonel Saputo has also received uh, letters of congratulations from General Tommy Frank, Senator Marco Rubio, Senator Bill Nelson, Governor Rick Scott, Mayor Rudy Giuliani, State Rep Greg Stubbe, and DAR Vice President General Ginger F. Trader, the National Chair of the Americanism Committee. Our next speaker is our keynote speaker. Colonel Gangle served 31 years on active duty and 11 years as a consultant to the Marine Corps. Notable combat commands include tours as an infantry, infantry platoon and infantry company commander in Vietnam and also an infantry regimental commander during Operation Desert Storm, during which Colonel Saputo and Gangle served together. Peacetime active duty assignments included tours as a reconnaissance company and reconnaissance battalion commander. After retirement from active duty in 1995, Colonel Gangle served six years as the senior operational advisor to the commanding general of the Marine Corps War Fighting Lab. Colonel Gangle's final years of service to the country were spent as executive director of the Center for Emerging Threats and Opportunities. Colonel Gangle, can you please join us now? It's a great honor for me to be here tonight and to participate in this event honoring John Saputo. When I was first contacted by Mary Lou McFate, she said, uh, I'd like you to talk for about 10 to 15 minutes. And I said, okay, that's fine, I can do that. Fear not, it's not gonna be that long. Because about three days later, I got an email from enforcer.com and it said, you've got eight minutes. And it was highlighted in red and bold caps. And my first thought was, hmm, Aristotle. Aristotle was a great philosopher. Aristotle talked too much. They killed him. <laughs> and then I thought, daughters of a revolution. And I thought, concealed handguns. She's probably got a handgun and a stopwatch in her pocket. I don't know where you are out there, but I'll be at eight minutes. I first met John Saputo in November of 19, excuse me, 1990, was it, John? In the desert of 29 Palms, California. And we were getting ready to go off to Desert Storm, and John reported to my command as the commanding officer of an assault amphibious vehicle company. Now, for those of you that aren't in the Marine Corps or care about the Marine Corps, an assault amphibious vehicle is a vehicle that is designed to move Marines from a ship to a hostile shore. It is what leads the assault onto the beach. These are the guys that are putting it all out there to get us into the fight. 
So we sailed across the Pacific to the Indian Ocean, and our mission, as we had been told, was to conduct an amphibious assault onto the shores of Kuwait, while the forces that were already ashore would attack up from the land side. Now, as we started going through all of our intelligence reports, it became readily apparent that this was not going to be a cakewalk. In fact, our estimates were that of the vehicles and the Marines that were in them approached the beach, we would take casualties of about 50%. Now, Marine officers lead from the front. And they never ask their men to do anything that they won't do. So who do you think would be in the lead vehicle leading the attack ashore? John Saputo. Now, thank God we never had to make that amphibious assault. We were used as a ruse against the enemy. And the main assault came up on land. We went ashore. And John went on to distinguish himself in combat. Now, the reason I tell you about this is because I think we need to talk about somebody else tonight, and that's Denise Saputo. Because while John is over there having to face the bullets, Denise is at home taking care of the family, taking care of the business, and wondering if she's ever going to see her husband again. In my mind, John deserves this award Oh, yes, he does. And so does Denise. So I ask you, stand, take your cups in your hand, and let's throw a toast at John and Denise Saputo. <laughs> to John and Denise. Thank you. John, Semper Fi. And that was only seven minutes and 28 seconds. Well done. You, you made the most of your time. Very nice. OK, now we're going to present the Medal of Honor. I'd like to invite the Florida State Vice Regent Ginger, Ginger Poffenberger to the podium to now present the Medal of Honor. Thank you, Ray. And if I could be joined by Cynthia Salandros, Don Lemongello, Ray, and Colonel Saputo, if you would come and join us, please. Mary Lou, would you join us, please? The most prestigious honor awarded by the DAR is given to an adult man or a woman who is a United States citizen by birth and has shown extraordinary qualities of leadership, trustworthiness, service, and patriotism. The recipient must have made unusual and lasting contributions to our American heritage by truly giving of himself or herself to his or her community, state, country, and fellow man. As Cynthia said earlier, membership in DAR is dependent upon proving your lineal descent from someone who participated in the American Revolution. Most of those ancestors were in the military. That makes it very, very fitting for us to today be making this award of the Medal of Honor to someone with a like military history. It is my great honor to present the 2014 Medal of Honor Award to Colonel John Saputo.
What an honor, those Marine Honor Guard, thank you all very much. And stand behind me with my Marine Corps flag uh, is, a, is a true honor. Um, you all know that, that know me and my business knew that I would not miss an opportunity for a little commercialism. So that is why those free Stella Artois and those free Stella glasses are on your glassware there. And you can take those home because I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try and sell something when I got a group this big, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I wanna thank, I see so many of my friends out here. It's amazing, Wells Fargo is here because they're my bank of record. And they show up at just about everything that I do because I owe them so damn much money. They want to make sure I'm alive. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Father Fausto was here because he knew I was a Jesuit prodigy in high school and in college. And, and he always likes to get his uh, digs in. And um, so it's just great to see all these friendly faces. Marianne Baim, who I made her speech when she was a judge down at the uh, center. I've got a gunnery sergeant Donovan here uh, that was one of my gunnies back in the back of the room back there. Um, and I want to say this has been a banner week for me. I had a granddaughter about six days ago, my son-in-law Devin and my daughter Beth. And they appropriately named her Reagan Grace, I think after our great president. And then to get this medal today, so it's been a, a heck of a week. I want to thank the DAR. You know, when the DAR was formed, I think it's a little ironic that I'm a third generation Italian kid. When the DAR was formed, my ancestors, you ladies, were stomping grapes, grapes in Italy, okay? And here I am a few generations later in front of you. But this organization, DAR, was one of the first to support our military after our first combat action in the Revolutionary War. From honoring their Revolutionary War ancestors to honoring and remembering, and most of all, loving our war on terrorism troops, because these ladies have been in the forefront. I take my hats off to them. As a lieutenant in 1974, wearing my uniform, I was spit upon in the Hilton Inn in Flint, Michigan at my brother's wedding. To stand in front of you, the America has really changed because I'm ending my career with an award for the DAR. And that's quite a contrast. Thank God America has changed since those days. And you Vietnam vets out there, and I met some of you, and Colonel Gangle, you remember those days. America has changed. You have really started to love your warriors and hate your politicians, which is the way it should be. <laughs> I, I really, really want to thank Mary McFate for dogging me the last year to make sure that I did this because uh, I, I don't like to blow my own horn. Um, and it's, it's, it's a little tough to stand up in front of all of you veterans and have this award knowing that there's so many other folks that deserve it. Colonel Gangle recognized my wife and I want to recognize her. And tonight I have two of my four daughters here and my son-in-law. Uh, Dr. Sarah Mackey and Andrea Cox. And I want to honor them because if you are a military family, you know why I must ask them also to be honored because they too were in the Marines and bore all the pain and the loss of my time, my affection. I miss their piano recitals, their gymnastics, their cheerleading. And there's nothing worse than being a dad, going to war a couple times as I did, and having little six eight-year-old, 14-year-old girls pulling on your uniform with tears in their eyes and a wife with tears in their eyes and saying goodbye and not knowing whether you're <coughs> ever going to see them again. While I was gone, both times that I was deployed, Denise served my troops and their wives while we were on deployment. She delivered babies while I was on deployment. She talked to all the wives, counseled their fears, and she was a a great asset to the Marine Corps also. And I want to recognize, are there any mothers of military people out here? Please raise your hand. Where's, where's Cindy Bellier? Is she here? Yes. These ladies have given us their children to go into combat. And I say to you ladies, hats off. You have the golden wombs that carry on a tradition, and thank you very much.
you know, back on to my family. Andrea, when I left for the second war, my third daughter was 25 or 26 years old, a couple years fresh out of University of Florida. And when I left, she was one of my junior officers in the company. And when I came back, the brewery said to me, we didn't know, we knew she was good and we know you had her trained since a child for this business, but we didn't know she could run the whole company. And I want to thank her in public for her service while I was gone. I want to recognize my Marine mentors. I had Lieutenant Colonel Ollie North as a uh, captain when I was a lieutenant. He taught me ambushing, patrolling, and some of those other nice little skills that we do. Uh, General Tommy Franks was just a prince of a guy, and I worked with him for many, many years at Central Command. General Ken Houghton, 2nd Marine Division Commander that I'm sure General uh, or Colonel Gangle remembers. He saved me from a court-martial. Um, I decided to take a captain's gig once when I was on a float, and his gig is his own private boat, and I filled it up with my Marines with beer and liquor and booze, and we went into town and had a great time, and the captain of the ship wasn't too happy about it, but General Houghton told him that that was what Marine officers are supposed to do. <laughs> and then, last but not least, I count him as, I think, my, my first combat mentor, and that's Colonel Gangle. Um, we used to say when you had a confrontation with Colonel Gangle that you were gangalized. This guy could make some speeches before you got ready to go into battle that would turn the hair on your head, and I didn't have much of it then either, straight up in the air, but fire you up where you want to eat nothing but raw meat and rip someone's heart out with your bare hands. And he was, he, he was definitely had his officer theatrics down pat, and uh, he could motivate all of us. But this award is bigger than me. It's not about me. It's about every American from Maine to California that wore a uniform. And on your tables, I want you to look under a couple of those um, saucers there, and there's a red card. And I call those death cards, death chits. These cards I want to serve as a reminder, and I want to dedicate this dinner and my award to those soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines that have died. That's a little personal recognition for their death so that we could be here tonight. Read their story, bring it home, tell your coworkers about it, okay? These cards serve as a reminder that this medal's for them. They probably died in an IED explosion, a sniper bullet, or a firefight. And it says on there how they died. This was an American, I want to remind you, that lived amongst us, went to school in our neighborhoods, and he's not just a government statistic. There were five, over 5,000 KIAs in the last 12 or 13 years in this war on terror, over 38,000 wounded, and I want to say the wounds are worse than those wounds from World War II and Korea and, and even Vietnam. Those explosions just would crush bones and faces and... Uh, disfigure people and, and sever limbs. And, and I want to recognize and make sure that you understand the horrible atrocities that were committed upon our guys in these last 10 or 13 years. We had, this war had women in it. And the combat patrols that I led in Iraq and Baghdad, I had three or four women in every single patrol because we had to because the, um, the bad guys were walking around in women's burqas with guns and explosives strapped to them. And in their culture, an, an American or a man could not even look at a woman and make eye contact with them without it being a tremendous insult. So we had to bring our ladies with us, and they served with distinction, the ones that I had for sure. There were 80, over 80 women killed in this war on terrorism, and over 800 of our women warriors were WIA. This week I was in Washington, D.C. at a legislative meeting. I went to the Iwo Jima Memorial, I had my cab driver stop to reflect on my 32-year Marine Corps career. It was where I took my oath of office to be a Marine. I thought about when I was 22 years old and stood there, all kinds of noble thoughts in my mind, starry-eyed with visions of liberating oppressed people. I wanted to give freedom to other people. That's why I wanted to serve. I watched this weekend something on the History Channel about a Jewish survivor. 
and it was very similar to Father Fausto's story, that when he saw a U.S. soldier, he, he left the Ukraine where his own people in Ukraine uh, abused him and made the Jews leave, and he went to Czechoslovakia. It was the same thing. Him and his family left there and went to Poland, and then they made their way to Germany. Can you imagine? A Jew that had been hiding for four years has to make his way to Germany to find the Americans. And when he found the Americans, he said, he said, that's who I wanted to be. He said, and when I saw the Americans, I knew I was safe and I knew I was free when he put his eyes on that American soldier. You know, the same thing, that's who I wanted to be. I wanted to be one of those American soldiers. It happened to me in Kuwait when Colonel Gangle led our armored columns into Kuwait and the citizens greeted us and the military soldiers from Kuwait greeted our mechanized columns with mementos and headdresses and beads. And I wanted to prevent atrocities like the ones, unfortunately, that have still occurred after World War II, like Rwanda or Sarajevo, and now in the Crimea. In the Crimea. You know that right now there are leaflets being passed out there again? Anti-Jewish leaflets again, just like in 1939 in Germany. And that is where I feel that there's a bit of disillusionment after 32 years that human nature has not changed. And I'm still a bit disillusioned about it because there's that element that hates. And you still need that Marine that can locate, close with, and destroy the enemy because of that. We have a warrior class in the United States. That's the 1% of the, your population that runs to the guns, leans into the bullets when they're flying, overcomes his fear, and chooses courage against hatred and fanaticism. In Desert Storm, <laughs> I didn't understand leadership until one day our headquarters was pinned down, a, a portion of it was pinned down. There was an RPG came at us, a machine gun, and we laid down there, and it was my anniversary. We laid down on our stomachs, and you know, I said, I yelled out to a bunch of Marines, I said, I'm, I'm not dying today, I don't know about you. And I got up, and I was a little hesitant when I got up with my M16 and my nine millimeter, but you know what, there was about 25 guys got up with me, and we attacked the position and we all lived. I had a saying that used to motivate my guys. I would say, oats for the horses and men for the, or, I'm sorry, oats for the horses and bud for my men, we ride to the guns at dawn. That is part of the warrior ethos again. We need the warrior class in the United States more than ever. The world's still dangerous. We have an enemy out there that hates us and believes in genocide as a form of warped religious purity. I helped at Central Command put over 100 prisoners in Guantanamo. I read all their interrogations. I watched some of the videos of their interrogations. And the last question every one of these interrogators would ask was, what would you do if we let you out of here? And they said to the man, all 100 that I looked at, Kill Jews, Christians, Americans, and British, okay? We said, okay, then you get to stay in Club Gitmo for a few more years because your attitude hasn't changed. <laughs> Talking about the warrior class, mothers want their sons and daughters to be doctors and lawyers and bankers, okay? But unless you realize that our society is very fragile and our freedoms are very fa fragile, um, we need a warrior class. And we have that warrior class. And if we don't have a warrior class, our way of life could be eliminated by fanaticisms like the Nazis tried to do in World War II. Every country, every religion, every tribe needs some sort of warrior class to protect them. We can't rely on our politicians or a political party. It was a political party, don't forget, that gave rise to Nazism. We must rely on ourselves and the children that we put in that warrior class to produce a warrior class or we will not survive. Remember that it was the Christian area of Germany in Bavaria, very Catholic Christian area that gave rise 
to Nazism. This award gives me a chance to tell you also a little something about your military and more about your warrior culture. We have ranks in the military, private, PFC, Lance Corporal, Corporal, and Sergeant. And I ask everybody that served, please stand up. Everybody that was ever in our military, please stand up. All right. Stay, stay standing, stay standing, please. This is, this is really great, because I know I got a friendly crowd here. I'm not going to get in trouble, OK? If you put these men in a room with each other for about 10 minutes, every one of you would tell you who outranks the other one, OK? <laughs> they would tell you to the day who's senior to who. And let me tell you why that is important to all of us. If you are a colonel, you will die for a lieutenant colonel and anyone below that rank. If you're a major or a lieutenant colonel, you will die for a captain, a first lieutenant. You will die for a sergeant. You will die for a PFC. You will die. You will risk your life. You will drag his body off that battlefield so his mother has something if he's dead. And you will drag his broken body to a helicopter and get it in there because you know your rank and you know your responsibility to every single person in that unit. Sit down, gents. This is the difference. This is the difference. That pecking order is the difference between the American fighting man, the Japanese fighting man, the German fighting man, even the Taliban. When you shot an officer in the Japanese army, or, a, or the, the lieutenant, the platoon commander in the German army, or you get the head Taliban, they fall apart. They cannot function. But Americans, we've got brass, OK? Because when the sergeant gets dragged off the battlefield, as this sergeant has been, and others of you that have a Purple Heart, that corporal and lance corporal are going to take over, and they're going to do as well as you did. That's your American fighting man. That's your warrior ethos. Every warrior knows where he's at in that pecking order. We also respect the power that the government gives us. Okay? One time, Colonel Gangle, um, he was always flying around the, uh, the battlefield in this helicopter with an M60 machine gun or, and, he would, and a 50 caliber machine gun, and he would always stop and get extra ammo from me. And he was manning this machine gun himself, a full bird colonel. Um, so he was a, little, he was a little psycho even then, and that's why I loved him so much, OK? <laughs> he gave us, we, we blasted through, I had some Marines, and we blasted through a minefield in a, in a town called El Wafra, and there was this huge cracking plant oil refinery type thing. And one of our helicopter pilots flew over and said he got shot at by eight to 10 people and Colonel Gangle and a couple other officers made the decision to line up. He flew in some, uh, he flew in some jets to bomb it. He opened up with artillery and then he tells, they tell Saputo to line up his 50 armored vehicles and six tanks and give the command with all the infantry, let everybody have some fun, fire into the, fire into the target. And when I dropped my hand and gave that command, and you saw all those vehicles, 275 men, all open fire, machine guns and everything, I stood in awe and I said to myself, no man on earth should have this kind of power. <laughs> and we got out of that uh, without any bad guys hurting any. Now, we expended probably maybe three and a half million dollars worth of ordnance and blew up a <laughs> We probably blew up a $200 million cracking plant that the Q80s owned. But you know what? Moms of the world, that's the way we do things. It, it's called overkill. And we didn't lose any men. So <laughs> I want to say just a couple other things on that. We take care of our troops from boot camp to grave. Boot camp to grave. Think about that. You belong to us from boot camp to grave. Our military takes an oath of office not to a king, not to a queen, not to a prince, not to a, a, a parliament. They, we take our oath of office, just as these daughters of the American Revolution do, to the Constitution of the United States. A and peace. Not your president. <laughs> okay, Gene. Um, we take it to the Constitution. We take our oath of office, we die for a piece of paper. 
That's what sets us apart from other countries. The warrior culture um, in Bangladesh, we landed and we, another thing that amazed me in this warrior culture, we took these Marines that were stone-faced killers in Kuwait and accomplished the mission and the colonel leads us to Bangladesh after a typhoon that hits and 120,000 people were dead and then to watch these stone-faced killers that were used to carrying guns turn into nurturing caregivers, feeding villagers, burying dead bodies on the beach. You know, like when we have red tide, bodies were floating on the beaches and in rivers. We pulled in children that were floating. And these Marines, we gave plasma to doctors. I was in awe of these Marines that they could go from warriors to humanitarians overnight. The warrior in them came from the Marine Corps, but this beautiful picture I painted of you, of them in Bangladesh, of holding babies and feeding children, gently burying bodies, that came from the mothers, their mothers and ladies in the room like you. General Petraeus said in a speech, what do you tell an 18-year-old kid that's being told by a teacher or parent that it will be bad for his future if he joins the military? There's a dangerous disconnect in America when teachers and parents tell their children this. And entirely too many Americans have no idea what kind of a burden our military is uh, bearing on a daily basis. In World War II, 11%, 11 percent, 11.2 percent of our nation served for four years. Ted Williams, famous baseball player, batted 400 the year that he went and joined the Marines to be a fighter pilot and then went back in Korea another year that he was batting about 350. Franklin Delano Roosevelt had two sons. Now these, these were the patricians of our country at that time. Had two sons. One was a famous Marine Raider who started the Marine Raiders um, in, in World War II. The Kennedys had two sons. Joe, their son, was a bomber pilot in England and he died trying to bomb a German sub base. And then we know President Kennedy that he served on a PT boat. Even the British royal family has a Prince Harry in Afghanistan. Prince Andrew fought as a helicopter pilot in the Falklands War, and I met his commanding officer, and I said, what, was, what were you most worried about? He said, telling the queen that I got her son killed, using him as bait so that Exocet missiles uh, uh, would fly into his helicopter instead of my ship. Lord Mountbatten of the royal family, he fought in World War II in Burma and was a hero, and he was killed by the IRA. All right, now let's go to Vietnam. In Vietnam, only 4.3% of our population served in that 12 years. And then in 2001 to now, only 0.45% of our population served in the global war on terrorism. These are unbelievable statistics. Over time, fewer and fewer people have shouldered more and more of the burden. Mothers want their sons to be doctors and lawyers, again, as I said, and do not mention the pride of being a warrior. Today, you ladies in the DAR validated my decision not to become an OBGYN that I think I wanted to do, um, but to be a warrior. Our troops were sent to war in Iraq by a Congress consisting of only 10% veterans, with only one senator having a son in the Marine Corps and the military. Taxes did not increase to pay for this war, as General Petraeus said. War bonds were not sold. Gas was not regulated. In fact, the average citizen was asked to sacrifice nothing. He has sacrificed nothing unless they have chosen out of the goodness of their hearts to be like the DAR and honor people, send care packages, donate to wounded warriors, Marine Corps Scholarship Fund or the Special Forces Scholarship Fund. And we have a Navy SEAL. Jordy Roush, please stand. Jordy, May 26, drums out of the SEALs. You watch on TV shows in Hollywood where every vet has PTSD, okay, and a violent strain of it. I have a theory that Colonel Gangle and I have discussed. I don't, and he doesn't have PTSD. Several of you out there probably don't have PTSD because when we returned, we returned to loving families. We had a mission, we had a job, and that's why we push jobs for vets. And there were other vets from World War II Korea and Vietnam that got us through 
the demons that were in our minds. When I first came back, my wife would see me having a bad day, and she'd say something, she said something eloquent to me that's always stuck with me. John, if it did not bother you to kill people, then you have lost your humanity. Suck it up, get over it. That's my Marine wife. All right, I want to end, and I know I'm not going to offend the Marines with this story, but uh, to show you that the spirit of the greatest generation is still alive and well, I want to talk about a Marine corporal in Afghanistan. This corporal, after spotting a group of 15 Taliban terrorists in Afghanistan who were about ready to ambush and kill his squad, Marine Corporal Clifford Woolridge, with his machine gun blazing, charged across an open field killed or wounded eight Taliban. He then boldly rushed around a corner wall after hearing more voices and came out face to face against four more Taliban within close range and immediately gunned down all three of these Taliban. Now his saw machine gun was empty. He jumped back behind the wall to reload but didn't have enough time when he noticed a gun barrel of one of the fourth guys that he had not killed on that last volley with his gun barrel sticking around the corner and he is less than three feet away. Came around the wall and he was using that wall as cover. Woolridge dropped his empty saw, grabbed the enemy's gun barrel and proceeded to beat the Ali Aqaba out of the Taliban <laughs> with his own gun, crushing his skull and effectively killing him and effectively ending the battle. Corporal Woolridge earned the Navy Cross for his actions. So don't tell me there's not another greatest generation coming up. Because these Marines have been sending these guys that want to die like that to go find their fictional 72 virgins for the last 12 years. I want to leave you with one, one other story. This is about my father. He was Corporal Russell J. Saputo, 2nd Marine Division, 2nd Tank Battalion in World War II. And I don't know whether it was after the Battle of Saipan or Okinawa, but he was told by their officers that a special guest was coming to see them after this battle. They were all excited. They thought it was going to be a Hollywood star. Betty Davis, Jane Russell, Greta Garbo. Well, out on the stage walks Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> now, you can imagine how, after these guys had been in the Pacific for 30, 36 months, and the lovely Miss Eleanor Roosevelt comes walking out on stage. Well, the Marines were a little less than cordial, a little less than generous to Mrs. Roosevelt because they thought that they were duped. My father said that they catcalled her a little bit, asked her to lift up her skirt, you know, typical stuff that GIs do. And Mrs. Roosevelt was a little bit upset, but she couldn't say anything after the lives that were lost in that battle. But she said this, the Marines I have seen around the world have the cleanest bodies, the filthiest minds, the highest morale, and the lowest morals of any group of animals I have ever seen. And then she closed with this, but thank God the United States Marines belong to us. Let me leave you with this, this is it. Go home and tell your children this, your sons and your daughters. Heroes don't wear capes, Armani suits, or French berets. They don't wear Abercrombie and Fitch designer clothes. They don't ask for participation badges or pay raises. They don't live in their parents' basement until they're 35. They wear ID tags and chevrons and bars on their arms, and they fight your wars. Love them as the daughters of American Revolution do, and as I do. No better friend, no worse enemy than a U.S. Marine. Just a few uh, quick announcements here before we resume our program. And we are well aware of the time. We want to get you out of here on a, at a decent hour. 
Good news for you. We have got a generous donor, a friend of John's, who would like to buy you all a beer. So ask your bartender for a Gold Coast Eagle beverage afterwards, and don't try to convert that to a glass of wine. That's not the point here. Also, if you, if you think you use the valet parking tonight, if you think you use the valet parking, you want to contact the Sarasota County Sheriff's Office. Those guys do not work here. <laughs> it works once in a while. Speaking of law enforcement, I want to acknowledge there's a, there's a lot of VIPs in this room tonight, but I'd be remiss not to acknowledge my tennis partner and good friend and police chief of Sarasota, Bernadette Topino, right there. Bernadette, stand up. <laughs> Done a great job for Sarasota since you arrived from Maryland. And I'm sure, I'm sure John is honored to have you here tonight as well. Thank you for being here. I'd like to thank our present. Oh, by the way, Dylan Duggan. Dylan, nice job on the keyboard and the piano. Dylan Duggan, folks. Excellent job. I'd like to thank our presenting sponsors, George and Justin Sketzos, Sylvia Barber, Jim Tubbs, Matt and Lisa Walsh, friends of the Goodwill Minnesota, Minnesota Regents Council, Tom and Roxanne Moore, Norton, Hammersley, Lopez, and Skokas, Salt of the Earth USA and Liberator Foundation, Sarasota Ford and Biter Enterprises, Wells Fargo, and Sylvia Barber. Thank you to all our sponsors tonight. Hope you also enjoyed seeing Lee Ann Brown. She was the one dressed in period costume, dressed as one of the DAR founders, Ellen Harden Walroth. Lee, Lee Ann, can you stand for us briefly? Thank you. I know you want to congratulate uh, Colonel Saputo this evening, and we have the chance to do that, as is often the case at these events with the uh, DAR. It's customary to have a receiving line. At the conclusion of our event tonight, please feel free to go through the line and greet our hosts and, of course, our Medal of Honor recipient. Ron Reagan is the chairman of the Florida Employer Support for the Guard and Reserve for District 11. This important Department of Defense agency serves the needs of National Guard and reservists and their families that are called to active duty. Mr. Reagan served as an elected member of uh, the House of Representatives in Florida for eight years. During that time, he served as a, in a number of capacities and key leadership positions, including Speaker Pro Tem, Majority Floor Leader, Majority Whip, Chairman of the Insurance Committee, Chairman of the Elections and Ethics Committee, and Vice Chair of Appropriations. Ron Reagan now will present their prestigious Seven Seals Award to, to Colonel Saputo, along with DAR members Mary McFate and Dave McCormick of the Department of Defense for Employer Support for Guard Preserve. It is my pleasure to bring on Ron Reagan. Uh, thank you very much. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. And uh, Colonel, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to, to give you this very uh, prestigious award. Um, first of all, before I get started, I want to introduce uh, Dave McCormick uh, uh, on my right to your left and Mary Lou, Mc, uh, Mary Lou McFate here on my left to your right, uh, very instrumental uh, individuals on, on our committee uh, for the ESGR, which is the Employer Support for the Guard and Reserve. And, and just a moment, if you're not familiar with that, uh, a lot of you military individuals will be familiar with that, but uh, this is a, a quasi-government agency that's supported by the Department of Defense. And its primary focus, primary, primarily its focus is to both um, uh, it, take care of individuals who are called to active duty uh, during times of war, during times of conflict, and to provide both a uh, uh, indoctrination as to what their rights are when they are called to duty, uh, and also when they return, what their rights are uh, to return to work, as well as for the employer. Now, in certain situations, and we have this one tonight, we have employers that, are, that go above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, and you've heard earlier, I will tell you this, uh, there's, there's a couple of reasons why Colonel Saputo is recent, receiving this award from the Department of Defense today. Uh, and number one is the fact that uh, he is a proud veteran sponsor as an employer. Uh, he's a proud sponsor for individuals that are members of the Guard and Reserve. Over one third of his employees are either retired or former veterans uh, or current uh, members of the National Guard. Uh, or the reserve. And it definitely gives us uh, a pleasure and an honor to uh, present this award. I, I will tell you one thing, though, um, just totally aside, 
I got to tell you how I first met the Colonel and Denise. And that is, uh, I was uh, running for office when they had just moved uh, to uh, our area. And I was late going to this event. And I was looking for a table, a room such as this. And I was going through, looking for, I was by myself, and I saw this open seat. And I had read about this guy who just came and took over the Anheuser-Busch distributorship for our area, but I never met him. So there happened to be an open seat at this particular table, and I plopped down, and everyone's getting ready to have their salad, and I had, not, had an opportunity to get a, a cocktail before the evening started, and a waiter comes walking by. And I grabbed him, I said, I said, can I ask a favor? He said, sure, what's that? He says, can I get a beer? And thank God, I ordered a Michelob. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> And this gentleman sitting next to me goes, you know what? Make that too, and I'm paying for it. So, <laughs> and he turns to me, he says, uh, my name is uh, John Saputo. I said, I'm Ron Reagan. Thank God I ordered the right beer. <laughs> John, I've never forgot that. So, <laughs> uh, and, and I'm just going to mention a few things about this award, and then we're going to ask the colonel to come up uh, and to receive this. But um, uh, this is a very prestigious uh, award that's given by the Department of Defense and ESGR employer support for the Guard and Reserve. Uh, it's given to a very few select employees, employers for meritorious leadership and initiative in support of the men and women who serve America in the National Guard and Reserves. Uh, as I mentioned before, I've got uh, David McCormick and Mary Lou McFate, uh, along with a couple of other people uh, in the Manatee, Sarasota County area. Uh, we serve as the uh, committee uh, for this uh, uh, ESGR for our area. And I will tell you that um, uh, I have served as the chairman since uh, 1999, as a matter of fact. Uh, and I will tell you, at the time, it, it was prestigious that I was the chairman of the committee. Uh, I enjoyed it. Um, but I will tell you, it changed everything in our area and the duties and responsibilities of this committee uh, in 2001, when we went from virtually having no guardsmen and reservists called to active duty to a, quite a number, including the colonel himself. So uh, without the help of the people to my right and to my left and several other people, I know that we could not do the job uh, that we do. Uh, one of the reasons Colonel Saputo is receiving this award is he continually, without question, goes above and beyond his call of duty and that he exceeds the minimum legal standards and requirements for granting leave to his employees and providing support for his military duty of all his employees. And I will tell you this, in the highest American tradition, he supports his patriotic employees for their voluntary service of an honorable and vital profession. And for that, we thank you, Colonel. As I mentioned before, one third of his employees are either veterans or members of the Guard and Reserves. It's, and it, just so you know this, uh, one third is way far above the national average. If you think about that, it's way far above the national average. I know the colonel uh, and his entire uh, staff goes above and beyond when they look for employees, uh, giving veterans preference uh, when they come to the, to the opportunities. Uh, Gold Coast does make it their policy and it makes it easy for their National Guard and representative reservist employees to respond to their state and their country in the time of need. Gold Coast continues company benefits while they are on active duty. And the employee's job is always available when they return. It gives me great pleasure and honor, Colonel, if you'll join us. I would take my glasses off, but I have to have this to read it. So. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Seven Seals Award from the Department of, Defense, De Department of Defense and the ESGR, Employer Support for the Guard and Reserve. It's presented to Colonel John Saputo for notorious leadership and initiative in support of the men and women who serve America in the National Guard and Reserve. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you very much. I gotta, gotta tell you something about hiring vets, okay? Yeah. Gotta tell you something about hiring vets. These kids, when they come out, they're clean cut, they're all Americans, they can pass drug tests. You tell them to work a 12 hour day, they can do it. They never quit, they never, they never give up on, on, on a goal or anything. And I want to recognize my son-in-law because when we hire these guys that know how to break down rifles and shoot and kill people, he breaks them in to make them beer salesmen. Thanks, Devin. <laughs> All right, I want to bring up uh, the uh, chaplain for the Sarah DeSoto chapter. Chaplain 
Jean Davies for our closing benediction. Jean, are you here? Yes. <laughs> you, are. you didn't win, but you can go. Yeah. Our Heavenly Father, who has taught that you will require much from those to whom much is given, grant that we whom you have called to so goodly a heritage may extend more abundantly to others what we so richly enjoy. And in our stewardship, we may know the glory of your love. We praise you as we take our departure. Amen.